And I want to share something because we're moving into something that, that really is a bit like what God said to Abram, just follow me. No compass, no map, just in the presence, abiding in the presence. But sometimes it's not easy to abide in the presence. You know, circumstances, situations, people, even myself, myself. Uh, it's not that easy to abide in the presence sometimes. Um, but a lot of it comes back to your imagination. And we started imagination last week, and I want to continue it because this is absolutely key. Imagination slash perspective. Um, Danielle will bring the computer back. Um, it, um, imagination slash perspective uh, slash mind, whatever, it, it's so many different things, but it is so absolutely imperative that we understand the power of imagination. You know, if you walk through the Gospels, you read the Gospels and you're walking with Jesus through the Gospels, like if you're walking with him, can you imagine yourself being with him? And you're standing with him. And the woman with the issue of blood is pushing away through the crowd. And the crowd's there, you know, and, and um, the, the temple priest is there. I can't remember his name. Well, if the temple priest is there. And if he'd known she had an issue of blood, she would have been stoned to death. But such is her passion. She'd heard about Jesus. And she'd heard about Jesus to such an extent that it had affected her imagination that she just saw herself healed if she could just touch the hem of his robe. If I can just get there, if I can just get into his presence, if I can just touch the hem of his robe, even though the risk was death, even though the risk was being recognised by the... The, uh, the leader of the temple, uh, even though there was, you know, if the people on the street even recognised her and, and decided to stone her. The risk was huge, but it was the, the, the fact that she had heard about Jesus and she knew that he was the healer and, and she had this, this repeating thought and it comes across like that in the Amplified, this repeating thought, if I can just get into his presence, if I can just touch the hem of his robe... I know I'll be healed because she had gotten to the stage where she saw herself healed. It's one thing to say, I know I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus, like I know I'm healed. We've got a revelation that, yeah, by the, I, I know I'm healed. But it's another thing altogether to have a, a revelation that it's actually happened. And she had this imagination, this, this painting, this vision on the inside of her that she could just get into his presence. She knew she would be healed. So she was already seeing herself healed. She was already seeing herself um, whole. She was already seeing the issue of blood dried up. She didn't see the obstacles anymore. She wasn't worried about the stone. She wasn't worried about the temple leader. She just saw herself whole because in her imagination she saw herself in his presence. So our imagination, whether it's good, positive or negative, your imagination is your destiny. Psalm 103 verse 14 says, God remembers our frame that it is but dust. And that word frame in the Hebrew is imagination because our imagination frames our life. It frames our relationships it frames our finances, it frames our work, it frames everything, it frames our health. Our imagination frames um, who we are and who we think we are. Uh, our imagination frames our circumstances. And we don't really recognise that, but the thing is your imagination does such a job on the inside of you, it changes things. And so we're aware that you know we can't afford to... That's why meditation of the word of God is so important because it actually frames your life and your life takes form around the frame of your imagination. Your finances take form around the frame of your imagination. Your health takes form around the frame of your imagination. And, you know, the imagination is so powerful in Genesis 11:6, when the, the Tower of Babel was being built by the men, the ungodly people, like the totally ungodly, unsaved, unregenerate, and they're building the Tower of Babel. It so threatened the plans of God that God himself came down to check out what they were doing and scatter them because he said anything that they have imagined they can do. That's the power of your imagination. Anything that you imagine, you can do. 
anything. That's why we have a limitless lifestyle. That's the way it is, you know? So recognize that the power of your imagination, good or positive or negative, will affect your life. If you feel like, you know, like for a long time, um, after the divorce as a single parent, you know, I just couldn't get on my feet no matter how hard I tried. I just couldn't seem to get there. And so I had this repetitive phrase in my head, what's the point? Nothing ever changes. What's the point? Nothing ever changes for me. And then I recognised that that was painting a picture on the inside of me that nothing would ever change. And I, so that's when the kids and I decided to bury poverty in the backyard and have a funeral service. Um, that's when I, you know, repented of uh, taking on the um, self-fulfilling prophecy of survival, uh, all of that. But it comes from your imagination. That's the frame of your life. That's what your life is formed around is your imagination. And it's just so powerful. It really is. So this is following on from last week. And we looked at King Saul, the amazing prophecies that he had, like amazing prophecies that he would prophesy with the God. I need to take my shoes off again. He was prophesying with the Lord and he would be turned into another man and he was turned into another man. And, and things changed, like he came under the influence of the Holy Spirit. He was totally changed as a man. He was totally changed, but it did not affect his imagination. It did not affect his frame. He still saw himself as insignificant. He still saw himself as the smallest and the weakest of the littlest tribe. And when they were looking for him to anoint him as king, he's hiding in the baggage. In with the luggage, he's hiding. This, this man who's taller than anybody else is, and who's good looking and tall and, and would look regal like a king, he's actually hiding away in with the luggage and the baggage because he didn't feel worthy. So even though we had these amazing prophecies, although everything was these, these prophecies coming from Samuel that, that was so true, and when he did prophesy, turn into another man, and everything that was prophesied was there, but because he did not allow the prophecies to in, in invade his imagination and take hold of him on the inside, it didn't change him. And because it didn't change him, he couldn't access the prophecies. Does this make sense? Because as a man or as a woman thinks in their heart, in their imagination, so they are. As you think, so you are. So he's not thinking anointed. He's not thinking prophetic fulfillment. He's not thinking king of the nation. He's thinking the soldiers are leaving, the people are deserting. I've got to, you know, kill the best of, of the enemy's flocks. Samuel said, I've got to get rid of them. So he's thinking contrary to the prophecies that were given because of the image of himself, because of his own imagination. So this is an area that we have to work at because another way of looking at it, uh, another word for imagination is actually conception. It's actually conception. Something is conceived in your imagination. And you've got to see it on the inside before you can have it on the outside. You've got to see it on the inside before you can have it on the outside. So in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, this, it says, The book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. That's actually a command. The word of God shall not depart out of your mouth day or night. You shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe and do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. Notice it doesn't say that God will make your way prosperous. It says that you will make your way prosperous. And you will deal wisely and have good success. So be strong and courageous. But that word meditate day and night so that you can observe to do, that word meditate, it means to speak, to meditate, to utter, to mutter, and it also means to imagine. So as you take hold of the word of God, imagine the word of God at work in your life. You know, add that scripture, as for you and your household, you sh they shall serve the Lord. Imagine every member of your household on their knees, lost in worship and adoration, crying out before God. Imagine it, see it, paint it on the inside, because that's what the word of God is. The word of God is an incorruptible seed, and one of the meanings of that word seed is sperma. It is sperm. It will, it will conceive life. So there are two types of words. There are corruptible and incorruptible. 
So the word of God is the incorruptible word of God, which is conceived on the inside of us in our imagination, brings forth life. But the corruptible words, which are words that we comes from the world, comes from what we think, what we feel, words of rejection, anger, hate, unforgiveness, bitterness, gossip, jealousy, whatever, uh, words of whatever they might be, those negative words, they also are a sperma. They will also conceive, but they won't bring forth life. They bring forth death because there are only two types of words, life or death, incorruptible or corruptible, blessing or cursing. There's, there's no other kind of word. There's no in-between. There's no grey area. We either speak life or I speak death. I speak blessing or cursing. I speak the incorruptible seed of the word of God or the corruptible seed of the world. There's no in-between. And so it says in Joshua that as you meditate, as you imagine the word of God, and so that word meditate means to mutter, to, it can also mean to groan, um, utter, mutter, speak, roar, groan, but it also can mean imagine. So as you, you shall imagine the word of God day and night, you shall imagine the word. Imagine the word day and night. And then you will observe. Revelation will come and you will know what to do. So revelation comes because you've meditated or imagined the word revelation comes. And as the revelation, revelation comes, then you actually see the action plan. You know what you've got to do. And then you make your way prosperous. God does not do it. Well, God does do it through the, um, the, the word of God that you meditate, that you imagine. It's done through that. But then we have our part. There's always two sides to the coin, isn't there? So as you do... As he's done, you do your part, he's provided the word of God, then we have to take hold of it, meditate it, imagine it. And then we make our way prosperous. We deal wisely. We have good success. A lot of people give their tithes and offerings and then sit back waiting for God to do something amazing in their life, waiting for God to favor them, waiting for God to promote them. And he will. But we have to do our part. What are you imagining on the inside? What are you seeing on the inside? You know, if you've got a, a, a family member who's sick or a family member who's addicted to something or a family member that just needs to get right with God, if you are looking at them and seeing that, you are still seeing them without the touch of God on their lives. You've got to imagine them with the hand of God on their lives. Imagine them healed. Imagine them set free from addiction. Imagine them worshipping God. This is the power of the imagination. So the thing that we don't understand is our imagination becomes our perspective. So when I used to think, oh, well, what's the point? Nothing ever changes. Life's always going to be like this. Life is always going to be hard. You know, that was such a lie from the pit of hell. But it, it is what I had painted in my imagination and it became my perspective and it then was the frame that my life formed around. And so it was when I realised, you know, like I forget who it was, I don't know whether it was a book or a, I don't know, that was a long time ago, but I remember when I got the revelation, oh my gosh, I am working against myself. I'm working against me. I am my own worst enemy. And so it was recognising that and saying, okay, what do I need to pull down? What do I, what do I need to come out of agreement with? What, how do I need to look at things differently? And so it's taking the time to get hold of that word of God and we have to meditate it, people. I don't care if you can memorise a thousand verses. It's the meditation that brings the life. Memorization just means it's in the memory bank. But when it's meditated, it actually becomes the word become flesh in your flesh. And so the imagination is just absolutely so important. So in Joshua 1.8, and, and this is it, you know, we started this year off by saying it was going to be a Goshen year, that we were going to be different to the world, that we were going to be protected, that we're going to be provisioned, that regardless of what went on in the world, <coughs> it would be different because we are God's people, that there is a redemptive line of, there's a line of redemption around our lives and families. And so what are you imagining about this year for yourself? Is it the year of open doors? Is it the year where you can see the redemptive line of blood around your life in every area so that you are live, actually living Goshen? Is it a year where you are seeing yourself living covenant? What are you seeing about this year? <clears throat> 
And then as they meditated and as they did these things, God, you know, things changed. If you turn over to Joshua 6, now there's so many different um, layers on this and Mike's got great teachings on this. But I want you to have a look in, in just for the sake of today, Joshua chapter 6 verse 2. And we look at Joshua, a fenced town, high walls, tightly closed because of the Israelites. No one went out or came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have given Jericho, its king, its mighty men of valor into your hands. See, I've given it. Had it been given into their hands in the natural? No. Did it look like it could ever possibly come into their hands? No. It was highly walled. It was tightly protected. No one could go out or come in. So it didn't look like it could happen. However, God said, see, just look, I have given it to you. So he has given you prosperity. He has given you divine health. He has given you wisdom. He's given you favor. He's given you position. He's given you, a, a, you know, an identity in Christ. He's given you a place where nothing can separate you from the love of God. He has given this to you. At the moment, it might not look like it because of work situations or financial situations or health situations or relational situations. It might not look like it. But see, this is, this is where faith comes in. This is the area of temptation. Are you going to agree with God or are you going to not agree? Are you going to say, yes, God, I can see in the realm of the spirit that you've given that to me and I take hold of it. I take hold of the fact that my family will serve the Lord. I take hold of the fact that my finances are increasing. I take hold of the fact that you are positioning me and favoring me in employment or in ministry or in business or whatever. I take hold of that by faith in the realm of the spirit. And so we take hold of it. But it didn't, in the natural, nothing looked like it was ever going to change. But the, the whole situation was, what are you seeing in your imagination? What, is the, what are you framing or forming your life around? The word of God or the fact that Jericho was this, this walled city that looked impossible to penetrate? What are you taking hold of? What is your mind playing with? And then God gives them instructions. Uh, you know, you'll march around the enclosure, all the men of war going around the city once, and you'll do this for six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And on the seventh day, you'll march around the enclosure seven times, and the priests will blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the enclosure shall fall down in its place, and the people shall go up over it, every man straight before him. So Joshua called them all together and gave them the instructions. And you know, one of the reasons, like, there's, like I said, there's layers and layers in this. But one of the reasons, one of the reasons why they said, do not say a word when you walk around this city. You've got to go around it seven times, or seven days, six days and then seven days. But so I don't want you to say a word. Do you know why? Because we would be saying things like, look how tall the walls are. Look how many soldiers they've got on the top of the walls. How on earth are we ever going to take this city? We would be speaking out our doubts, our worries, our fears. We'd be speaking out our concerns. We'd be speaking out a whole lot of different things. You know, like, did Joshua really hear from God? Did Joshua really get it right? I mean, is this really going to happen? They would be speaking out a whole lot of unbelief. They would be speaking out a whole lot of worry, doubt, fear, ignorance, a whole lot of all different things. That's why God says, shut the mouth. The same with the Elizabeth's husband, John. You know, when he questioned when the angel came and said, your wife's going to be pregnant. And he said, well, he was fearful. And he said, well, this can't be sort of thing. And, and the angel just shut his mouth because your words will either open up your future or close it down. There's no in the middle. You will either enlarge your, your future or you will shut it down. You know, it just, there's no other way. This is what the way we're made. We're made in his image and he created his world with his words. We create our world with our words. And so God knew that the state of their hearts, that they were not going to speak in agreement with him. So just walk around. And while they walked around and their mouths were quiet, their mind were mulling over Joshua's words, listening to what God had told him. And so when it got to the stage of the seventh day and they'd gone around seven times, 
and they released that shout and the priest blew on the ram's horns. It wasn't just the shout that did it. It wasn't just the ram's horn that released the frequencies and the vibrations. It was the breath of the Holy Spirit on their obedience that tore down the walls. The breath of the Holy Spirit blowing through those trumpets. The breath of the Holy Spirit going through the people as they shouted because they were in agreement with God. Their hearts were fully persuaded. They were in agreement with God. And so their imagination actually caused the downfall of Jericho. But so often, in, and as a pastor, as a Christian, we pray for so many people. And then, you've, you know, and I'm praying from a place of, well, I know when I lay hands on you, you're going to be healed. Then I'll pray for them. And you get, well, no, the pain's still there. No, it's not work, the pain's still there. But you know what? That's not faith. That's sense-led do you understand what I mean? Yes. You know, if, if you, you've got to come to the place where you know you're healed. When you know you're healed in the inside, that's when you come for prayer for healing. You can come for healing, prayer for healing, but if you are not convinced that it's going to work, it's hope. It's not faith. God answers faith. He is the God of hope, but he needs faith. Kenneth Hagen would often tell people, do you believe when I lay hands on you that you will be healed? And he would get things like, well, I hope so. And he would say, go and sit down. Come back to a few more meetings. And when you know that you know that you know that when I lay hands on you, you'll be healed. So we've got to allow the imagination to do a thorough work. Do you really see yourself living in divine health? You know, I had some symptoms this week and I thought, well, that's absolutely ridiculous because if it's not in Jesus, it can't be in me. If it's not in him, it can't be in me because I'm in him. He's in me. As he is, so am I in this world. And so, you know, recognising, well, what are you imagining? So I want you to think, of, right, if you've got a piece of paper or on your phone or something, one area in your life that has been a, a thorn in your side, for want of a better word. An area where you, you just can't quite get the victory, you can't quite get the breakthrough, nothing ever seems to change. Think about that one area. And what is the picture on your heart? How do you see yourself? If you really listen to yourself. I do this in life coaching. I'll say to people, tell me that the, the top five things you think about money. It's hard to get. There's never enough to go around. All of these things, that's the image they've painted on the inside of them. But if they, t they tell me, oh, you know, like God's my source and it's just such an abundance for me everywhere I turn, everything I touch turns to gold. Well, you know that the image that they've painted on the inside is one of prosperity. Remember 3 John 2, above all things, I want you to prosper and I want you to live in health, but the condition is even as your soul prospers even as you imagine, even as you see it for yourself in your heart, as you think in your heart, those things. The imagination is key, but the thing is we often use our imagination as our perspective because that's what it is. It's our frame about which our life is formed, but it's a wrong perspective. It's not Christ. Is this making sense? You go, I'm very quiet. So we need to, to think about the, the, what we actually envisage. So sometimes we just need to be quiet. And so, Holy Spirit, how do I really see my health? Do I ever see myself regaining my health? I might know that I've been healed. That's one thing. I know I've been healed. But do I actually see myself healed I know that God is a God who prospers but am I actually seeing prosperity for me so we can know one thing but what are you actually seeing what are you imagining what is the picture the vision that you carry in your heart so we need to be quiet because sometimes you know we get things like well I don't feel like that's ever going to happen you know, I've been promised this, it's been prophesied over me, but I just, I just can't see it. 
we go right there, we can see that we're painting a different image on the inside than one of the Word of God. Mark 11, you know, 23, 24. Just keep your finger in Joshua and just turn to Mark. Mark 11, 23, 24. I should know this off heart. Twenty-three. Jesus is speaking and he says, truly, I tell you. So what I do when I read scriptures like this, let me, oh gosh, Lord, you're such your presence. Um, <laughs> let me tell you how I read that scripture. Truly, Jesus is telling me. So I personalize it. Whenever, when, when I say to the mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and I don't doubt at all in my heart, but I believe that what I say takes place, it is done for me because I have whatever I say because Jesus has told me. So I personalize those scriptures and I speak them out like that. And for this reason, um, Jesus tells me that whatever I ask for in prayer, as I believe and trust and be confident that it is granted to me, then I will get it. So I personalise the scriptures. I see Jesus talking to me. I see him speaking to me and saying, you know, Suzette, by my stripes you've been healed. Suzette, I've come and I've taken away all the sicknesses and all the infirmities off your life. Suzette, I've done this for you. I see Jesus talking to me. I, am, I walk through the Bible and I imagine Jesus and I walking together through it. When he lays hands upon the sick, I'm, I see myself laying hands on the sick. When he raises somebody from the dead, I see myself doing it. I imagine these things but when you take verses like that um, you know personalize it personalize it put your name in there when Jesus says truly I'm telling you I say Tru Jesus has truly told me and it becomes my verse and I can start to use that to paint a picture on my heart change the imagination but the thing about verse 24 is it says whatever 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 like no limits, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that it is granted to you, present tense. When I, when I pray, I believe I receive it right then and it will be granted to me, future tense. So it's a bit like when I buy a book from Amazon. I press that click button, I pay that order. I, that book is mine. I have not yet received it, but it's my book. I've, I've ordered it. It's in my name. I've got the, you know, it's there. It, I have received it and I will get it in the mail. So this is what we've got to understand about the imagination. You have to see it first on the inside before you can manifest it on the outside. That's why you hear people saying, I'm believing God. You know, I, I, I speak and speak and speak and say and say and say that by his stripes I'm healed, but oh, my back's killing me. I've just had an angina attack or this has happened or that's happened. And by the, they've just, they just cut across the truth of the word of God with what they see about themselves on the inside and they don't get their healing. Does this make sense? Or you don't get your prosperity or you don't get what you need because we say that well, I'm agreeing with the word of God, you know, by his stripes I'm healed. I definitely agree with that. But oh, oh, you know, this is wrong and that's wrong and nothing's going to change. So you, 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 cross, you cross pollinate the word of God with the word of the world or the word of the flesh. And it's the picture that you've painted in your, in, on the inside of you that manifests. Your imagination is the frame about which your life is formed. Double-mindedness. Double so it's really important that we, we paint the word of God on the inside of ourselves. Yeah. Can I ask? So I think when it comes to imagination, uh, if it's not captured properly... I can see that sometimes it leads people into a, a state of desire and mm -hmm. want, and then it turns into hope deferred. Yeah. So maybe if you could speak to preventing yourself from going down that. Yeah. Um, what Cambry was saying, sometimes people imagine things, but they don't really see it manifested. Yeah. That's, um, oh, I've got that in there somewhere. It's about faith. 
Uh, you know the parable in Mark chapter 4 where the sower sows the, the seed? That's the start of the imagination, the incorruptible seed of the word of God. And then it sprouts, but the man doesn't know how it sprouts. Day and night, he sleeps and the thing continues to grow. And first the, first the sprout, then the stalk, then the head... But it's still not the full manifestation of imagination because it's when the head is full of, of the seed. That's when, that's when the imagination is fully formed. Quite often happens is we don't spend enough time imagining things and so it's kind of half-baked. Um, it's kind of like almost but not quite. But when, it, when you can actually see the fullness of it, that's when... That's when you can possess it. But if we go off following after an imagination that's not quite settled, not quite fully baked, not quite fully fleshed out, um, that's still kind of a combination of, yeah, I, 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 can, I know the scripture, building it in my heart, but it hasn't come to full maturity. You can't harvest it. There's nothing to harvest. And it will take you down that path of hope deferred makes the heart sick. That's why, that's why meditation, that's why God says, meditate the word day and night. Psalm 119, around about verses 99 to 103 or something like that, talks about the power of meditation and how important it is. And this is something that we've lost. These, these old disciplines of the, of the um, disciples. Disciples are disciplined, hey? Um, but it's, it's that kind of, you've got to meditate it so that you see yourself fully healed. And I don't see myself healed. I actually see myself now, and I'm not saying this is fully baked, I'm almost there. But I see myself living from the power of Christ's endless, indestructible life on the inside of me. I live from his life. I see with his sight. I hear with his hearing. It's not about just being healed by his stripes, but it's the power of his life on the inside. So what is it that you see about the area that's a thorn in your side? What do you imagine? What's in your heart? Because it's a lie. And what is the scripture that the Holy Spirit wants to replace that with? The scripture that if you meditate it, it will bring forth life and wholeness. Was that enough? I think so. So, imagination is the place where the results appear, really. First Peter one twenty three talks about the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. First Peter one twenty three. And it says, you have not been regenerated or born again. You have been regenerated and born again, but not from a mortal origin, not from a mortal seed or sperm, but from the immortal, by the incorruptible seed of the word of God. And so that is, that's actually the word sperm. It actually means that you will conceive from the incorruptible word of God. You will conceive whatever the promises of God on the inside. You will conceive it in your imagination. But if you take hold, of the word of the world, if you take hold of the word of flesh, the corruptible seed of that kind of word, what you will conceive on the inside of you is not what you want. It is sickness, poverty, frustration, lack of destiny, lack of vision. It's all of those things. You've got to take the seed of the incorruptible word of God and paint just the inside of that with you. It's what do you actually see? What is it that you are crying out for? What is it that you're looking to God for? You get hold of that incorruptible seed of the word of God and you receive it as an implant and let it be implanted into your imagination, into the spiritual womb that you carry, and that it will bring forth life. It will come to full term. See, a lot of things is we do not allow things to come to full term. And that's where we get our Ishmael's. That's where we get it's close enough, looks uh, close enough is good enough, the old Aussie thing. Yes, she, she'll be right, but it's not right. And so this, this is why it's so important. What, what are you actually thinking about? Now, you know that scripture in, in Isaiah 26.3. Now that I've said that, my mind has gone completely blank. Um, 
Isaiah 26, 3, he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on the Lord, right? Let me just... You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he commits himself to you. That word mind actually means imagination. So if you keep your mind... God will keep if you keep your God will keep you in perfect peace as you keep your imagination stayed on Jesus. What is your imagination stayed on? Now let me tell you how quickly imagination can work. As a single mum with a stack of teenage kids, curfew, not home by curfew, give them five minutes. Not home by not home and they're late getting home. No phone call wasn't a lot of cell phones back then either, you know. But they're late getting home. I haven't heard from... Where does my mind go? Yeah, there's something, they've had an accident. I hope they're okay. I immediately go to fear. So my, my imagination has not been kept on the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. You can tell when you react to something what is in your imagination. When you get that bill that you weren't expecting financially, where does, your, where does your head go? If it goes to, I don't know how we're going to pay this, I don't know how we're going to cope with the increase in rent or mortgage payments or whatever, if your head goes there, then your imagination has not been, um, is, hasn't been conceiving the prosperity of the word of God. It's been conceiving the poverty and the toil of the world's earth curse system. If you go to a doctor and you get a doctor's report and it's not what you want or it's not what you're expecting and it's bad news or something happens in the family, where your head takes you shows you the state of your imagination. Because if you had kept your mind, your imagination stayed on Christ, you'd be kept in perfect peace. So when there's no peace, there is a sure sign that your imagination is been feeding on the corruptible seed of the word of God, of the word of the world, and not feeding on the incorruptible seed of the word of God. So you can instantly tell that by the way where your mind goes. Instantly. So it just, and there's no condemnation or anything there. It's just saying, well, okay, I recognize that in that area of my life, I need to come back and meditate the word of God. So what is the scripture that the Lord wants you to meditate? What is the scripture, the incorruptible seed, that incorruptible sperm of the word of God that will, you need to conceive on the inside of you so that you bring forth in your life what God has ordained for you? See, in the, it, we lose things if we don't allow the imagination to be implanted by the seed of the incorruptible word of God. Our perspective is wrong. Our expectations are less than what they should be. We're not walking in the fullness of what God is saying. So let me just move a little bit quickly forward. So words are either corruptible or incorruptible, but they are also seed. And if you look that up in the Strongs, it is sperm. So we, can, we get words spoken over us all the time all the time. Words are either spoken over us or to us or about us, right? People can speak to me, people can speak about me, speak people, all sorts of things. Our imagination can be formed by circumstances and situations that we've gone through in the past. You know, if you've only ever had trouble and torment, then you, you come to the place where that's all that you expect. If, if life's been a bit of a drama, then that's what we expect. We need to change these things. So what do you think about yourself, whether it's positive or negative? What has been implanted into you? What is it in you that is conceiving and framing and forming your life? So King David, he had a lot of time meditating the word of God. He's a shepherd as a young boy. He's out looking after the sheep. He wasn't really an, even invited into his father's house when Samuel came looking for the next king. He was an afterthought. So he's out there by himself with the sheep, plenty of time to meditate, check out the stars, think about God's creation. Amazing. Read the scriptures, see, see all the, the amazing things. 
But he also had dealt with the lion and the bear, and he knew the power of God, and he knew the power of covenant. So he had created an, an, an image on the inside of him, and I think it is Zig Ziglar who said that the biggest nation in the world is the imagination. So, but King David, or David, had planted an image on the inside of him. It allowed his imagination to mature to the point where he knew it doesn't matter whether it's a lion or a bear or a giant. I'm in covenant with an almighty God. And when I'm in covenant with an almighty God, it doesn't matter who or what comes against me. It doesn't matter whether I stand by myself or whether the king and the army is behind me. I know that God is with me and I know that that giant goes down. See, he knows. So one of the challenges I have with some of the people that I pray for, particularly in business, is they don't have a full understanding that God is with them, that they're in covenant with an almighty God, that if God is on their side, then how dare anybody come against them? If God is for you, then who can be against you? Like, come on. He always causes you to triumph in Christ. You're more than an, a conqueror. You're, a, you know, you're an overcomer. Like, God has not planned failure for us. God has not planned it for us. We might have chosen it. We might have, like, slipped into it we might not have recognized what was happening but God has not planned failure God has not he might prune a little bit but in the pruning it's for more fruitfulness but that's not failure that's pruning that's a completely different thing right and so what God wants for you is not the way the world thinks God has got prosperity health wealth wisdom he's got understanding knowledge there's the spirits of God that the seven spirits of God the spirit of prayer and supplication the spirit of faith He's got all of these things that he wants you to walk in. He wants you to be outstanding. He wants to, the people of the world to see that everything you put your hand to prospers. He wants you, people to see you walking in divine health and divine wisdom and releasing divine solutions and carrying a presence that when you walk into boardrooms or walk into any situation, things change, not because of you, but because of the one who lives within you, the power of God, the power of the word of God, the spirit of God that's within you, the glory that covers you. Oh my gosh, you are not a human being anymore. You are not a human being anymore. You are a spiritual being having a human experience. I, I'm, you know, divine aliens. Woohoo! Divine aliens. I'm not a human being. I'm something different, but we're not living like it. And, but that is what God is wanting. That, that's what he wants expressed, the power of Christ. You know, he got on so well with sinners that they really couldn't wait to get into the kingdom. And half the time, we don't really even know any sinners because we're so caught up in church and, and fellowshipping with each other. We don't want to hang around sinners because, man, they just don't understand. But light should be in the darkness. Light should be in the darkness. You need to have some good, solid sinner friends that you can pray through to salvation, that you can love into the kingdom, that you can, you know, take them out for dinner and, and meet with them, you know, and just love them. Like, I don't understand. You look around and all of a sudden there's no sinners in your life. There might be a few family members that really need a good dose of God, but no, no real sinners. That, but where, where else are they going to hear? They're not going to come to church. They might come to a home meeting, have a meal. They're not going to come to church. No one is beating down the door to get into the kingdom. We need to be out there with them. Jesus was. Tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes. Man, he knew the sinners. He loved them. He loved them. We've got to be the same. Radical in our, our outlook and life. But in some ways, you know, we're very... Um, I don't know what the word is. I don't know whether it's civilised or castrated. Because where is the power of God in our lives? Where is the power of God in our lives? On a consistent, regular basis. That if, can we walk down the street and see somebody healed? Like Peter? Yes, absolute. Absolute. How often do we raise the dead? I've only raised one. How often can we raise the dead? Come on. You know, like things have got to change, right? And actually, it wasn't I that said the church was castrated. That was Al Houghton. But I just, you know, it was either civilised or that. Because honestly, where, where is the radical power of God released in our communities? You know, with um, the, the woman that used to come and, and minister with us, um, Kathy Walters. They would stand around a public state school in England and pray 
and all the kids in the school would fall down under the power of God. All right? They would have house meetings where people would get so drunk walking in the door that they'd have to help them across the door into the room. They'd have, a house, they'd have their house meeting. People are getting drunker and drunker and drunker and then it's time to go. So they're opening the door and the people are sort of, you know, drunkenly wandering out and they're falling over neighbours' bushes and falling into people's gardens and all sorts of things. And then the neighbours are calling the police because of these drunken people coming out of Kathy's house all the time. So the, the police pick the bodies up out of the neighbours' gardens or off the, out of the gutters and take them back to Kathy's house and say, these belong to you. But they weren't drunk, drunk. They were spiritually just so inebriated under the power of the Holy Spirit. When was the last time you were so lost in the power and the inebriation of the Holy Spirit that you couldn't walk? Like, come on. What is, what is it that we've built on the inside of us that kind of like refuses the move of the Holy Spirit? We'll go so far. We'll, we'll like, oh, yeah, that was really good. That, oh, there. Yeah. And we can fall down under the thing of the Spirit. But the rest of it, where you just absolutely lose control, where he takes over, what, what do we do that we don't move like that? Why are we so together? We shouldn't be that together. We should be so open to the Holy Spirit doing whatever he wants to do that whether we're flat on our backs on the floor or, you know, crying out for God in repentance or, or having a, a wonderful time. of It doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter who's around you because you're so caught up in Christ, so caught up with God, so caught up with the Holy Spirit. Who cares who's in the room with you? Who cares what's, what they think? I'm having such a good time with God. Like, what happened? Where did we lose it? Change what you see on the inside. Start reading some really good um, hi history books about the early church because that's your family. You know, it was the Celts that kept Christianity alive when Romans institutionalised everything. You ought to read some of those stories. Wild stuff. A horse came and draped its, its um, head on a, on a saint's shoulder and started to cry, a horse. And the other people in the community said, what's, what's going on here? And the, the guy knew that he was going home to heaven. He knew that he was being called home. The horse knew, but none of the people around him knew. We've got, to, we've got to go back. Guys, we've got, we've got to let go of this, whatever it is that stops us from flowing in the reality of the Holy Spirit, that stops us from picking up on what he wants us to pick up on. We've got to go back to that. So whatever it is, and this is where the imagination comes in. So as you go through the Bible, see yourself walking with Jesus. Feel the dust are on your feet. If you're looking at the, you know, the blood sacrifices, see the flies buzzing around. Get into the reality of the word of God. Because that's the reality. This isn't the reality. The word of God is the reality. That's the incorruptible side of life. You know, the Roman battalion that had given their life to Christ, not the one that was on the lake, but another one. And, um, and Caesar was furious on what it was. He'd sent them away to quell a rebellion in, a, in Gaul somewhere. And when the Roman soldiers arrived, they realised that the people they were to quell were also Christians. And they said, we can't fight against our brothers. We can't fight them. And so Caesar was furious and he said, well, if you can't fight them, and if you won't recant Christ, then I will decimate you, which meant every tenth soldier would be killed. And they said, we can't turn our back on Jesus and we can't fight a covenant brother. Every tenth soldier was killed. Again. Again. And not once, not once, did they bow, that bow their knee to anyone but Jesus. This is your heritage. This is your family line. 
Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, David, your family line. Who they are flows through your spiritual DNA. What are you painting in your imagination that is affecting your perspective? Do you see yourself living in the fullness of the Father's word? Do you see the angels around you? What do you actually see? Father has so much more planned for you than what you have. So that one area that is a, a, a pain, a thorn in the sight, get rid of it. Start to imagine the truth. Start to imagine the truth. So going back to King David, Goliath turns up. The king won't face him. The soldiers, the army won't face him. They're all cowering away. Goliath comes out for 40 days and, and you know, declares his challenge. And David just, he doesn't even give it a second thought. He says, what do I get out of this? What's in it for me? I'm going for this. I get a wife, I get free tax, and I get something else. So he was in it. He went for it because in his heart, in his imagination, he saw himself always conquering because, he, because of the covenant he had with God. Right? He saw himself that way. That was his imagination. Um, Goliath turns up, but David wasn't intimidated. He wasn't afraid. He wasn't fearful. He didn't think twice about it. He just said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that would dare to do this to the tribe of God, the, the army of God, the Israel? Like, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Think about that at work. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine who keeps giving me a hard time? Right? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? I pray for them to get saved. Holy Spirit, grab them by the scruff of the neck and drag them to the foot of the cross. But I get the victory now in Jesus' name. Righteous anger. But he was a man after God's own heart. He was quick to repent, was not perfect. Ask Bathsheba, was not perfect. He was a great king. He was a lousy father. There was incest in the family. He didn't do anything to fix it. Betrayal by his son. Great king, lousy father, loved the women. So it was worse for Solomon in that respect. But if you have a look in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, and this is what I want to show you, the power of your imagination. Now, David wanted to build a temple to the Lord, didn't he? That was in his heart. That's what he wanted to do. 1 Chronicles chapter 28 or 27. 28 that's all he wanted was to build a tabernacle to the Lord bless you and in verse 2 first chronicles 28 2 David the king rose to his feet and said hear me my brethren my people I myself intended to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord as a footstool for our God and I prepared materials for the building but God said to me, you shall not build a house for my name because you've been a man of war and have shed blood. However, the Lord, the God of Israel, chose me before all my father's house to be king over Israel forever. And he chose Judah to be the ruler. And of the house of Judah, he chose the house of my father. And among the sons of my father, he was pleased to make me king over all Israel. And of all my sons, for the Lord has given me many sons, he's chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. And then he goes on to say that God said he would establish his kingdom forever. But the imagination of David, he had uh, conceived in his imagination this temple of the Lord that he had actually made plans for Solomon. He had everything planned out for Solomon. Have a look in verse 10. And he's, take heed now, for the Lord has chosen you, Solomon, to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Verse 11. Then David gave Solomon, his son, the plan. 
See, David had imagined it so much, even though God had said, well, you're not going to build this because there's blood on your hands, but I'll give it to your son. David could have said, okay, then, well, that's Solomon's problem, right? Solomon can get the plan. Solomon can sort it out. But it was his imagination. It had been conceived on the inside of David. It had taken root on the inside of David. He had conceived it. And so in verse 11, he gave Solomon, his son, the plan of the vestibule of the temple, its houses, its treasuries, its upper chambers, its inner rooms and the place for the ark and the mercy seat and the plan of all that he had in mind by the spirit for the courts of the house of the Lord the surrounding chambers the treasuries of the house of God and the treasuries for the dedicated dedicated gifts verse 13 the plan for the divisions of the priests and the Levites for all the work of the service in the house of the Lord for all the vessels for service in the house of the Lord and then the next verse he says and I and he had even worked out how much gold and silver would be needed for the construction of everything David had thought about everything he had allowed the uh, his imagination to receive the fullness of what God wanted to build and he was able to put out all the blueprints for the vestibules and the chambers and for the this and for the that and how the priests were going to work and for the weight of the gold and everything and in verse 19 he says and all this the Lord made me understand by the writing of his hand upon me all the work to be done according to the details of the plan see the thing is that's that's the frame of your life as you imagine it that becomes the frame the plan of your life your imagination is the frame, the form around which everything comes, which re really relates down to the plan for your life. So whether you are living God's plan or your own plan, it comes from what is in your imagination. What is, as you think in your heart, so are you. You know, if you want to be kept in perfect peace, your imagination, your imagination, not your head conscious thoughts, not what you think here, but your imagination must be stayed upon the Lord. So what is the word of God speaking? to you? What kind of a vision is it imprinting upon you? Do you see yourself anointed? Do you see yourself commissioned? Do you see yourself called into destiny? Do you see yourself being a nation changer? How do you see yourself? Because God wants to implant that into you, conceive it in you by the power of the word of God, the incorruptible seed, that sperm of God so that it will become life on the inside of you and you will live it. But you know, you've got to see yourself seated in Christ in heavenly places. See yourself in ascendancy. See yourself raising the dead. See yourself releasing um, people from sickness and disease. See yourself with an abundant provision so that you can walk in and buy a car for yourself and buy a car for the neighbour. You know, like, what do you see? Because it's what you see on the inside is what you're going to see on the outside. So how are you building your life? What is your frame? What is your form? And then David, if you have a look in, in, over the page, about all the plans, all the silver and the gold and everything. And then in 1 Chronicles 29, he says in verse 2, I have provided with all my might for the house of my God. So even though he was told Solomon would build it, it was still the, the vision that he had seen from the very beginning. And he said, I have provided with all my might for the house of God, for the gold, um, for the silver, for things of silver, bronze, for things of bronze, iron for iron, wood for wood, and it goes on and on. And he said, because I've set my affection on the house of God, in addition to all I have prepared for the holy house, I have a private treasure of gold and silver which I give for the house of my God. So there's 3,000 talents of gold and gold of Ophir and 7,000 talents. So billions of dollars worth of stuff. You know, from the kingdom and from his own personal treasury. And then the, the mighty men of God, they had their stuff because he had cast the vision to such an extent that the imagination that they had was all about the house of God. What are you doing? So I'll admit, I repent, but I've been a, a little bit of a, um, I wasn't feeling well this week, so I had a little bit of a TV binge. If I see another English TV show, <sighs> I'm over it. But I went on a bit of a TV lying on the lounge feeling sorry for myself. Yes, I know I'm healed. I see myself healed. Yeah, I understand about the imagination. I'm just going to watch telly. <laughs> Human, right? Working it out like everybody else. But the thing is, when I was doing that, 
I was carving my imagination in a way that was contrary to the word of God. I was making space in my imagination for a thing of the world. So I'm either making space in my imagination for God's word or the world's word. What do I want? I'm carving a space. I'm creating a new frame for a TV show. <laughs> but it was, it, was, it was a frame. I was recreating a frame in my imagination, but it would not help me in anything that God had called me to do. Wouldn't help me in anything. Didn't help me feel better, even though I thought, you know, I just need to, I just need to veg out. Didn't help me feel better didn't um, anoint me, didn't change anything, it just pulled me down. So whatever we participate in creates a space in our imagination for the incorruptible seed of God's word or the corruptible seed of the world. Now it's okay to watch a bit of telly, I'm not saying you can't watch it, but I am saying binge is not great. But as we move forward, there are things that you're going to have to allow yourself to be the frame to form in your imagination. You are going to have to be glory carriers. Solution suppliers. Release healing. Heal marriages. Bring wholeness to provision. You have all been called. You have all been chosen. And you have all been commissioned. But what do you actually see about yourself is what makes the end product. Because we saw with King Saul called, commissioned, anointed, but lost, lost it. David, coming up rough, sinned, didn't have his act together, and yet he provided the plans, everything required for the temple. So what are you framing your life around for the call of God on your life? For all of you, Amber, you have a particular call. And some people are not going to understand it. But it is a very specific and unique call of God upon your life. And there will be people who are going to come along and say, you should be doing it this way and you should be doing it that way. Some of them will be from God and some of them will be not. But you need to understand that you need to hear from God for yourself. And you do. And that's what you start to build. That's your imagination. That's what you start to frame your life around because you have a very unique call upon your life. So, where do we go from here? Up. Up. <laughs> Up. <laughs> So have you sorted out what need, in your imagination what needs to be changed? What, what needs to be changed in your imagination? Do you have the scripture that God wants you to have to meditate so that it actually starts to conceive in you what he wants? And as, as we're learning from Reese Howell, no cross purposes, no, no TV binging, no cross purposes, no cross pollination, no compromise. Just purity. Just purity. Kurt, you've been unusually quiet. Anything you want to say? Feel free to. Thank you, Lord. So, again, just 
Find people you're comfortable with and pray. And ask God, why don't you pray? I'm giving you something to pray. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Let me read it to you from the Amplified. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Just pray this for one another. This is the uh, Amplified Classic. May the God of peace himself, so let me pray this for you. May the God of peace himself sanctify each and every one of you through and through separating you from profane things, making you pure and wholly consecrated to God. And may your spirits and souls and bodies be preserved sound and complete and found blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. For faithful is he who has called you and utterly trustworthy, and he will fulfill his call by keeping you. Yeah. Amen.